Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Fahuri and I am the director of the Cancer Legal Resource Center. Um, you're joining us today for our webinar on navigating health insurance in a changing health insurance climate and um, I I guess I knew something was going to be happening in September when we originally made this webinar schedule um, because things are kind of uh, up in the air right now. So uh, we're going to try to navigate through some of this together. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Please um, feel free to ask questions uh, in the question or in the chat box. Um, I will try to leave some time for questions at the end of the webinar today, but there's a lot of information to get through. If I'm not able to get to your question, please know you can always follow up with us and I'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. Um, I am recording the webinar. We will be posting it on our YouTube page. So rest assured if you have to leave early or if you have colleagues or friends or family that you think might benefit from this webinar, um, you'll definitely be able to share it with them. So let's get started here. So just as a quick overview of the CLRC in case this is the first time that you are joining us for a webinar, um, our mission is to provide information and resources on cancer related legal issues to anyone coping with cancer including patients, survivors, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Uh, we are a program of the Disability Rights Legal Center. We're based in Los Angeles. We primarily operate on an uh, education model, which means that we don't provide direct uh, legal assistance, we don't provide legal advice, but we try to educate people about what their rights are so that hopefully uh, they feel empowered to be able to advocate for themselves. And our ultimate goal is, is to do that before they actually even need some sort of additional legal intervention by an attorney. We have a lot of online educational materials on our website, so if you are curious about some of the other topics that we provide information on, please feel free to check out our website. Um, we have a great resource called our Patient Legal Handbook, um, which is available in both English and Spanish. Many of our other uh, handouts are also available in Spanish. And then obviously, you're already quite familiar with the fact that we provide webinars. I just wanted to flag a couple of things. First, all of our webinars are recorded and shared on our YouTube site. Some of our older webinars are available directly on our website, but if you're curious about what we've covered in the past, please feel free to check that out. Um, I also wanted to flag that I'm not going to be discussing too much about Medicare during today's uh, webinar because our next upcoming webinar in October is going to focus exclusively on um, either how to sign up for or how to change enrollment in Medicare. So if you have specific questions about Medicare and, and how to navigate through um, some of those different options, definitely check back in with us uh, for our webinar in October. And then, like I said, I will do my best to try to answer questions during today's uh, webinar if, the, if we have time at the end. If I'm not able to get to the, those questions or if they might potentially require a bit more research on my part, please keep in mind that you can always reach out to us directly. Um, in the past, we've directed people to our telephone assistance line. We now have an online intake form, which honestly is a little bit, it's a, a faster way to get in touch with us. So you can always go to clrcintake.org, fill out the information, and then we can uh, give you a call back with some information. Um, and I guess everyone here probably has internet access since you're on a webinar, so you shouldn't need to leave us a voicemail on our telephone line. Um, okay. So today we're going to be talking about navigating what a lot of people consider a complete disaster of a maze when it comes to healthcare. And part of the reason that we want to do this is because, you know, I think a lot of people expect that doctors, surgeons, nurses, and other healthcare professionals who are treating patients 
already know what's covered by insurance plans or what isn't. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. Um, the CLRC has some helpful documents and information uh, for you, but really our goal is to make sure that you have a basic understanding of not only your health care options, but also how to navigate through um, whatever type of health care provider or health uh, insurance you have so that you can maximize your coverage, hopefully prevent some surprise or unwanted bills, um, and really feel empowered to take control of your health care. Um, the reality is it's really up to the patient to understand what's going on with their health insurance coverage. It's not the provider's responsibility. So here's a little roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. Part one, health insurance basics to make sure everyone's sort of on the same page. Part two, some tips for taking control of your health care. Part three, some information about health insurance rules and different options that are potentially available. And then part four, we'll talk a little bit about health insurance appeals. But first, as you are hopefully at least somewhat aware, um, it has been over seven years since the Affordable Care Act was passed, and yet it continues to be a really prominent topic of conversation in Washington. Uh, after efforts under Obama's administration to repeal and or replace the ACA failed, uh, many Republicans thought that with the majority in the White House and this, uh, with the, sorry, with a majority in the House and Senate and with the White House, that the Trump administration would easily be able to repeal or replace the Affordable Care Act. However, um, there were a couple of efforts this summer with respect to the American Health Care Act, the AHCA, or the Better Care Reconciliation Act, um, BCRA, and Fortunately, uh, the GOP was unable to get enough votes in the Senate to get anything to Trump's desk. So when the BCRA failed, when McCain um, gave that deciding vote, we were super excited and we're hoping that this was going to be the end of the Obamacare ACA repeal and replace, um, and we were sort of celebrating. However, um, Senators Lindsey Graham from South Carolina and uh, Cassidy from Louisiana are making one last push with an ACA repeal bill. So it's being referred to as Graham-Cassidy. The Senate is facing a deadline of September 30th to pass legislation with the simple majority allowed under the budget reconciliation rules. Normally, the Senate requires a 60-vote majority to pass any legislation, which is supposed to be a high bar that makes it hard for the Senate to quickly pass major pieces of legislation. It's supposed to prevent the majority party from just pushing legislation through the Senate, and unfortunately, the way that things are working out right now, um, the budget reconciliation is a way that allows the majority to get around that 60 vote safeguard. So reconciliation lets the Senate majority bypass any sort of filibuster process and allows them to pass legislation with 50 votes instead of the 60 that are normally needed. Um, and so if they're not able to get this bill passed by September 30th, then they would need a supermajority to pass, which seems highly unlikely. However, right now the rumblings in Washington are that the vote is likely to happen next week. Um, obviously it would have to happen sometime before September 30th, but they're, they're saying right now probably next week, and it's looking like um, they might actually potentially have the votes or might be able to get the votes by next week. So um, just a little background on Graham-Cassidy and, and what it would potentially do. Um, essentially, it would substitute a block grant for the funding that now provides states with resources for Medicaid expansion, for premium tax credits, and for cost sharing reduction subsidies. Um, it would um, 
essentially take money from the states that expanded Medicaid and gives that money to the states that did not. It would also allow states to apply for waivers to get out of two key Obamacare policies that protect people who are sick or who have a history of illness. So um, potentially insurance companies or states would be able to submit waivers to get out of the requirement that they don't discriminate based on pre-existing conditions. Um, and they also might be able to waive out of the requirement to cover all essential health benefits like prescription drugs, mental health um, access, and you know stuff like that. So we're currently working with some other partners to try to defeat this bill. The vote is likely to happen next week. So if this is something that you find to be rather scary or think that your patients would potentially um, really you know suffer from if if some of these changes take place, please uh, you know be as active as you as you would like to be, but it's a good idea to call and write to your senators. Um, I also wanted to just flag that even without Graham Cassidy, the Trump administration is looking for other ways to try to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. So um, one thing that has already gone into effect, which I'll highlight again later in the workshop, or sorry, in the webinar, um, is that they've already shortened open enrollment. You know, in the past, open enrollment has gone from November 1st until January 31st. And for this upcoming year, this op upcoming open enrollment period, uh, they've decided to limit it to only six weeks. So November 1st to December 15th. Um, They've also drastically reduced the advertising budget and the in-person outreach budget. Um, essentially, the, the Affordable Care Act's success hinges on a large number of healthy people enrolling in marketplace coverage to help offset the costs that come with also insuring people with pre-existing conditions or people who are currently sick. Experts expect that less outreach and less advertising will re lead to fewer people enrolling in coverage, and those most likely left to, uh, most likely to be left behind are the young, healthy enrollees who hold down the premiums for everyone else. The in-person outreach efforts also ensure that vulnerable populations, like those that don't speak English or lack internet access, can still enroll. So essentially, they're setting the law up to fail. Um, the Trump administration is trying to focus on digital advertising, but at this point it seems like that's going to be taking the form of reminder emails and texts to people who have already signed up for coverage. So again, this is potentially a really big problem if young healthy people who should be signing up for coverage are not getting the message that they can or should do so. Um, there are also ongoing threats to the cost-sharing subsidies that exist. Um, these subsidies reimbursed insurers for reducing deductibles, co-payments, and other out-of-pocket costs that low-income people pay when they visit their doctors, fill prescriptions, or receive care at hospitals. Um, and then there's constant threats uh, to budget cuts to Medicaid as well. So, you know, both with respect to Graham Cassidy and outside of that, there's it's just a, a huge threat to the Affordable Care Act and to um, the access to care that a lot of people have come to rely on over the last, you know, three, four, five, seven years. So there's a lot going on right now with respect to the Affordable Care Act. Even if you aren't in the market for in, an individual health insurance plan, um, even if you don't currently have an individual health insurance plan, you know, or if you're not on Medicaid or Medi-Cal, potentially some of these changes to the Affordable Care Act could still have a pretty big effect on you, even as someone who receives, you know, potentially employer-sponsored health insurance. So I'm going to be going over information in the rest of the webinar in the context that the ACA will continue to exist for 2018, keeping in mind a few changes that have already occurred, like the open enrollment, like I just mentioned. Um, and some of this information here is relevant regardless of what's going on in Washington. So, um, 
you know, if you have additional questions that come up as things progress in Washington, you can always reach back out to us. It's possible we might offer sort of a follow-up webinar um, should there be any major changes. But fingers crossed, please contact your Congress people um, if this is something that's important to you, which I assume it is if you're sitting here on, on this webinar. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, it's the patient's responsibility to understand his or her health insurance coverage, and we really can't rely on the healthcare professionals that are treating us to be able to explain um, or have, you know, a ton of knowledge about what our, our plans are. There are so many different types of insurance policies out there. Many of them cover a number of different things. So. Um, we're going to go over in part one just some basic information that everyone should know and understand about insurance. So first, this is the most basic thing. It's important to know, do you have private insurance or are you um, on a public program? So public program, Medicare and Medicaid, private insurance, something that you buy directly from an insurance company or you buy it through your state's health insurance marketplace or it's potentially offered as a benefit through your employer. These are just a couple of different examples of different private insurance uh, carriers, you know, United Healthcare is a huge one, Aetna, Cigna, etc. It's also a good idea to have a sense of what if you have private insurance, is it a group or individual plan? A group plan is one, you know, if it's offered through work, you generally have a group plan. If you've purchased it on your own, it's an individual plan. If you have group health coverage through your employer, it's also a good idea to know whether that coverage is considered insured or self-insured. An insured plan is where employers just pay the premiums for each employee to an insurance company. That's usually the most common way that, that people have insurance through their employer. But for a self-insured plan, the employer takes on the risk of paying for the employee's health care instead of purchasing through an insurance company. So this happens more frequently if you work for a large company, um, if you work for a hospital or hospital system, a lot of times they're considered self-insured. And then it's also important to know whether your plan is currently grandfathered. A grandfathered health insurance plan is one that existed before the Affordable Care Act was passed um, back in 2010. And the reason that I flag all of these things is because grandfathered plans or self-insured plans um, might not have to follow all of the same rules that um, an insured a newer insured plan might have to under the Affordable Care Act. So um, if you're not sure what type of plan you have, you can always ask HR if you have insurance through work. You can always contact your insurance company directly. And if your plan is grandfathered, the plan is actually required to notify you that it is that it remains grandfathered. So it's also a good idea to understand what type of health insurance policy you have because that might dictate, you know, what type of network you can go through um, and what your, what your options are for seeking care in network. So an HMO um, is pretty common, stands for Health Maintenance or Organization. There are two, basically two different types of HMOs. So the first is called an Independent Physician Association or IPA. IPAs have physicians that practice in their own offices that are known as medical groups. And then the second type of HMO is a standalone facility. So it's an insurance company hospital that you visit for everything having to do with your, with your case. So um, Kaiser is an example of a standalone HMO facility. Another option is a PPO or Preferred Provider Organization. Um, a PPO has a provider network that's usually less limited than an HMO and they generally reimburse at slightly higher rates than um, for services out of network, but they can be more expensive. The monthly premiums might be a little more expensive than uh, for an HMO. There's a point of service, POS, 
that's a hybrid, kind of like an HMO plan where you might be required to designate a primary care physician who makes referrals. Um, and then EPO stands for Exclusive Provider Organization. And as a member of an EPO, you can use doctors and hospitals within the EPO network, but cannot go outside the, of the network for care. There are no out-of-network benefits. So if you're in the market for a new plan or if your employer is potentially giving you new options to look into, you might want to opt for a PPO or HMO as opposed to an EPO. EPOs are pretty limiting. A couple other really important terms to keep in mind. Um, it's a good idea to have a sense of what your copay, coinsurance, and deductible are going to be for any given year. Uh, copay is the fixed amount. So, for example, maybe you pay $25 every time you go for a doctor's visit. Um, coinsurance is your share of a covered healthcare service um, calculated as a percentage. So. Um, you might pay 20%, let's say you have a 20% coinsurance on some sort of uh, treatment or, or service. So if, for example, if the health insurance plan's allowed amount for an office visit is $100 and you've met your deductible, your coinsurance payment would be $20. Um, and then the health insurance plan pays the rest. A deductible is the amount that you owe for covered healthcare services before your health insurance plan begins to pay. So if your deductible is $1,000, your plan won't pay anything until you've paid $1,000 out of your pocket for covered services. Um, some plans pay for certain healthcare services before you've met your deductible, and I'll touch a little bit on that a little bit later. Uh, it's also a good idea to know how the billing works at your doctor's office. Some uh, healthcare providers will obviously bill the insurance company directly, and then you'll get notification of that later. Some other organizations or other healthcare providers who maybe don't accept your insurance might provide you with some sort of super bill or some other type of bill that you would then submit for reimbursement. So it's a good idea to have a sense of what that looks like ahead of time before you actually show up at the doctor's office. And then it's really important to know whether or not certain procedures might require pre-authorization. Um, it's not a guarantee that if you have something pre-authorized that it will actually then later be paid for, but if, you, if your plan requires pre-authorization for something and you don't get it, you're almost definitely not going to have it paid for. So um, that is something to keep in mind. Okay, so now that we've talked about a couple of the basics of health insurance, we're going to move into tips for taking control of your health care. Um, just knowing what type of insurance you have might not be enough. So um, let's see here. Okay, I really can't stress this enough how important it is to read your policy. You have to play an active role in your healthcare delivery, including billing and payment, as awful as it may all seem. Do not be caught unaware of what your coverage is. If you read something in your policy that you don't understand, call customer service and take notes. Beyond just knowing what type of plan you have and how much your deductible is, you might need to know what percentage of certain services are covered, who's in your network, whether they reimburse for out-of-network coverage. And I know that this can be especially challenging for people who are currently going through treatment or who have completed treatment, but you're still dealing with potential cognitive issues uh, related to your treatment. So if you don't have the energy to do this, check and see if a friend or family member that you trust would be willing to help you out with this. Um, I can't, I really just can't stress enough how important it is to, to have a sense of what your coverage is. Do not rely on your providers to, to know what's going on because potentially they might recommend certain courses of treatment or certain medications and they might have no sense of whether or not that's covered under your plan or what, your, what percentage you would be responsible for. So um, it's really up to you to to really take control to understand what your coverage is. You might want to know, okay, so if I'm supposed to read my policy, where do I find it? 
well, you can look at the summary plan description, your evidence of coverage booklet, you might have the health plan contract. Often this information is available online through your health insurance company's website. They usually give you a username and password. You can log in, you can see, you can look up a provider list to see who's in network, although to be honest, a lot of times those are not accurate. So it's always a good idea to call and confirm with the doctor first. Um, but if you can't find it online or if you're having trouble navigating through the your insurance online portal, you can also call the insurance company and request a hard copy of your plan documents. And if you get your insurance through work, if you're really struggling to you know, get down to the bottom of what your plan is and what's covered, you can also always talk to your HR department. Okay, so a couple other t practical tips for optimizing your health insurance. Um, patients can check with insurance companies to see if they offer a case manager. Case managers can be your go-to person for information about your plan. And often they will even go through appeals or advocate on your behalf to gain coverage or reduce costs. If your plan does not offer case managers or patient navigators, you can at least ask to speak with the same person each time you call so that you're not having to sort of reinvent the wheel every time you call. And it can also be, I know how frustrating it is to call an insurance company and to have to talk to someone who doesn't know what you're going through and doesn't know what your, you know, what your current situation is, but it can go a long way to make friends with the person that's on the other end of the phone because having some positive rapport can really potentially mean that they might go to bat for you in ways that they might not otherwise have done. Um, and then obviously avoid having to re-explain your ent entire story every time you call. So every time you have to contact your insurance company, it's a good idea to keep accurate records, the date and time, what you discussed, who you discussed it with. Um, that might not, it might, you might not ever need to look back at that information, but if you do have to end up submitting an appeal for something down the road, it might be worthwhile to be able to bring in some concrete information about what you discussed and with whom. Um, again, getting pre-authorizations in writing when possible, it's a great idea. And this is something that I like to mention in a lot of the workshops that I give, but I think one thing that people really overlook is the idea of opening their mail. Um, even when you're not sick, and even when you don't have potentially looming medical debt, um, opening the mail, unless it's, you know, a birthday card or something like that can, can sort of be a drag. But if you don't open your mail, and you receive information in writing from your insurance company where they've maybe denied coverage of something or they've told you that they're only reimbursing a certain amount. If you don't open the mail and you miss uh, ap uh, appeal deadlines, potentially there's there might not be any way to appeal decisions if you've waited too long. Um, so it's really important to stay on top of that. And again, if you don't have the energy to do that, or if, you know, if you're serving patients that, you know, might not have the energy to really deal with their mail and you're concerned that they might be um, struggling to, to keep up with what's going on, you might want to suggest, or, you know, if you are the, the patient yourself, you might want to ask a friend or family member, again, to sort of help, even, even if they don't open the mail for you, to just help sort through what's junk and what's important. Even just that, that really basic thing can be helpful because the last thing you want is to miss deadlines just because you didn't open the mail. And then, of course, remember, billing mistakes happen. It's a good idea to look over the bills that you receive. Um, sometimes they can be really confusing. A lot of times they you get a bill way later from when you actually went in for your treatment or service. Um, but it's a good idea. If anything looks out of sorts, you can always contact the billing department um, at your ho the hospital or the uh, provider's office, and sometimes They've just made a mistake and all it takes is someone saying, hey, what, what is this number about? And they might realize the mistake and, you know, credit you back with money or reduce the bill. So a couple more tips. 
Um, although it, it may, many of them try not to be, doctors can be extremely intimidating. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, feel free to write down your questions before you get to the doctor's office. Um, you can ask to take notes. You can ask to record the doctor visit. You can ask someone to come with you. And don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion. Many states, including California, require health plans to pay for a second opinion. So, you know, sometimes you, we hear from people who say, oh, you know, I want to get a second opinion, but I don't, I don't have the money to pay for it out of pocket. Well, depending on where you live, it's possible that your insurance company might have to cover a second opinion. So, of course, that only means that they have to pay for a second opinion within network. So it doesn't mean that you have like a blank check to just go to whatever doctor you want for a second opinion, uh, but they are potentially required to uh, pay for a second opinion in network. And then, of course, if you have the money, you're always able to go out of network for, um, for any number of opinions if you really need to or want to. Um, a couple tips about obtaining prescription medications and how to sort of navigate that. So just like with your overall insurance plan, it's a good idea to become familiar with your prescription drug benefits. Medications generally have to be um, approved by the FDA. So if you are running into an issue where you've tried a number of different medications and none of them are really working, but your doctor thinks that there might be um, other options for you that aren't widely available, there are a couple of different ways that you might potentially be able to access medications. So there's something called compassionate use, also known as expanded access. Um, those programs allow a manufacturer to give certain individuals a medication that is being tested in clinical trials before the FDA has made a decision about approving or not approving the drug. So um, it's something that you have to apply for with your physician. Um, there's a lot of information on the FDA's website about how to go about doing that. Um, there's also potentially the option for off-label prescriptions um, where maybe a drug has been approved for one type of treatment or any number of different types of treatment. Maybe it hasn't officially been approved for what you need it for, but sometimes a doctor will know, oh, okay, well this, you know, we usually use this for this type of tumor, but we've heard about success, you know, for your type of cancer, so we'd like to try to prescribe that. The one thing I will flag about off-label prescriptions is that it can be difficult to get an insurance company to cover them. So keep that in mind. And then another thing to, um, to keep in mind too is that prescription drug plans have something called formulary lists. And a formulary list is basically where it outlines the different levels of coverage for different types of prescription medications. So Sometimes if a doctor prescribes a brand new drug, that might be at a higher tier, which means that your copay might be a lot more money. You might, if you're running into an issue where you're sort of struggling to pay for those copays with your prescription drugs, it's a good idea to talk to your provider to see, you know, is there an equivalent that's on a lower tier in your formulary that maybe you only have a $5 copay instead of a $75 copay. Um, other times, potentially your insurance company or your prescription drug plan might require you to go through what is called step therapy, where you essentially try other types of medications first that are less expensive, and then if they are not successful, then they'll approve uh, the more expensive drug. So there are a few different ways to sort of navigate through this prescription medication access. Um, the CLRC actually has a brand new handout available on our website that goes into a little bit more detail about some of these issues. So if this is something that you're interested in, please feel free to check out our website. Okay, so moving along here, part three health insurance rules and options. So now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to potentially maximize that coverage, 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the options that you might have if you need to purchase new coverage and some of the things that those new plans have to include or cover. Again, just as a little caveat, all of this information is presented in the context that nothing is going to be changing with respect to the Affordable Care Act for this upcoming year. So feel free to, to use this information as, as you see fit. So as I mentioned earlier, the ACA continues to be the law of the land. Um, and so if it's been a while since insurance has really been on your radar, here are a few really important things to keep in mind about how the Affordable Care Act has um, helped increase access to care. So just a couple changes. Um, First, young adults and children up to age 26 can stay on their parents' health insurance plan. Um, previously, kids usually had to be full-time students or dependent for you know, tax purposes in order to stay on a parent's uh, health insurance plan, but that is no longer the case. So hopefully this means that a lot more children and young adults are uh, obtaining and remaining covered. Um, there are also no longer lifetime or annual limits allowed on essential health benefits. This is one of the things that's potentially at risk right now if some of these you know, different plans or the Graham-Cassidy bill goes through, potentially states would be able to, to submit a waiver to get around this. But the way things are right now, if somebody is, you know, having cancer treatment or accessing prescription drugs or needs mental health services, there are no lifetime or annual limits allowed on those types of services. In the past, plans could say, you know, $50,000 a year is your maximum, or you've got a $3 million lifetime maximum on this plan. And of course, if you get sick, it's super easy to reach those limits you know, within one doctor's appointment, one surgery, or, you know, a couple months of treatment. So no lifetime or annual limits is really huge. There are also insurance companies, insurance companies are no longer allowed to retroactively cancel or rescind a policy unless you have committed fraud or um, failed to pay your premiums. So if you have, if you simply forgot to dot some I's and cross some T's on your application, they can't go back and say, no, we're canceling your, your plan. You either have to have stopped paying your premiums or you have to have committed fraud, such as claiming somebody as a dependent who actually isn't a dependent or, you know, giving someone else's address when you don't actually live there, that type of thing. And then one other important thing to keep in mind is that certain preventive services now for non-grandfathered plans, so for newer plans, certain preventive services must be covered without your having to pay a copay, coinsurance, or meet your deductible when the services are provided by a network provider. So certain things like colorectal cancer screening over age 50 and mammograms, uh, cervical cancer screenings, HPV vaccination, um, annual wellness visits, certain things like that are now potentially offered um, without having to make, uh, meet your deductible or pay copay or coinsurance. And if you have a grandfathered plan, that doesn't mean that your plan doesn't have to cover these things, it just means that you might have some cost sharing. So the number one thing that I would say has made a huge difference for the people that we serve and the people that we hear from on our telephone assistance line and when we're out in the community doing these workshops. You know, in the past, before the ACA, if somebody lost their employer-sponsored health insurance, or maybe they never had insurance in the first place and realized, oh my gosh, I'm sick, I need to try to get some sort of health insurance coverage, Insurance providers used to be able to discriminate based on pre-existing conditions and could either say, no, we're not going to cover you at all, or sure, we'll cover you, but here is this astronomically high price tag for your monthly premiums, which were usually completely unaffordable. As of January 1st, 2014, insurers are no longer allowed to uh, look at pre-existing conditions, health status, medical history, genetic information, 
or gender uh, when determining whether or not to provide coverage to someone and also whether or not to or how much to charge that person. So they cannot look at any of this information when deciding how much to charge you or whether or not to cover you. Again, this is something that's at risk right now, so um, we're really hoping that, you know, Graham Cassidy does not go through. Um, the only things that insurance companies are currently able to look at when deciding your rate and or, and or whether to cover you is your age and where you live. Um, some states also allow insurance companies to charge smokers more than non-smokers, but not all states do that. So if you don't have health insurance currently or if you're facing a loss of insurance, there are still a couple of options. Um, some of these existed before the ACA, some of them are newer, um, so I'll just go through each of them really quickly. First, there's COBRA. COBRA is a federal law that provides for the ability to continue on the same coverage that you had, either while you were working or um, while you were married, you know, if, if you're getting divorced, or if there's some other um, qualifying event that's taking place, like maybe the person that's covered by, uh, the primary person covered by insurance has died, or maybe that person has become eligible for Medicare. There are a few different things that potentially make you eligible for COBRA coverage, and I think the, the biggest thing that's, that confuses people is that it's not, you're not signing up for a brand new plan. It's literally to just stay on the same plan that you uh, already had. The only change is that you become responsible for the full amount of the premiums, uh, including potentially a, a 2% uh, administrative cost. So whatever your employer was paying total for your health insurance premiums, you become responsible for that, plus a 2% administrative uh, fee. You might qualify for COBRA if you work for an employee, employer with 20 or more employees or you know, 20 or more people on the group plan. Um, and depending on the reason that you become eligible, you can, you're eligible for either 18 or 36 months of coverage. Some states have uh, laws that are similar to COBRA that cover people that work for smaller employers. So as an example, in California, we have something called CalCOBRA, and if you're on CalCobra, uh, or in order to be eligible for CalCobra, you have to work for an employer that has between two and 19 employees, and it lasts for 18 months. You can also potentially tack it on to the end of your regular COBRA coverage for a, a total of up to 36 months. Um, but these state mini COBRA laws, again, can be pretty expensive, so not only are you responsible for the full 100% of the premiums that your employer might have been paying, um, but the administrative fee can go up to about 10%. So um, yeah, you could be responsible for up to 110% of what your employer was previously paying. Now before the ACA, this is sort of where the conversation ended. Some states had um, major risk plans or high risk pools that people with pre-existing conditions could potentially apply for, but often they had long wait periods, the premiums were still really expensive, so a lot of people who couldn't afford COBRA or their state COBRA plan essentially were out of luck. They would, they would stay on as long as they could afford to do so, but some people couldn't even afford one month of COBRA. Um, so it's really nice that th there's now potentially another option for people to purchase new insurance if they're facing a loss of, of coverage. So um, if COBRA or your state COBRA plan is too expensive, you might be eligible for a special enrollment period of 60 days to purchase, purchase insurance through your state or federal marketplace. Um, you can purchase a plan either if you qualify for special enrollment period so, for example, if you've lost your job, if you've moved, if you've gotten married, you've gotten divorced, again, if some, something special has changed, some life circumstance has changed, you might be eligible for a special enrollment period. Other than that, in order to purchase a new insurance plan, you would have to do it during open enrollment. Um, 
You can also potentially purchase insurance directly from an insurance company, but if you are looking, if you're under a certain income level and you're potentially looking for premium assistance, the only way to get that is to purchase through the health insurance marketplace. So if you're looking to purchase insurance through your state's marketplace or through healthcare.gov, um, like I said, you either have to do that during open enrollment or if you, uh, during the 60 days that you might potentially be eligible for a special enrollment period if you've had a major change in your life. So the Trump administration has changed open enrollment for the federal marketplace um, for this year. In the past, it was November 1st to January 31st, gave people lots of time to sign up for coverage. Um, they have reduced that for this year to to November 1st to December 15th, and that is for coverage that starts on January 1st. However, if you live in a state that runs its own marketplace, such as, for example, California, or in Colorado, um, some states have taken it upon themselves to extend open enrollment beyond what uh, the Trump administration has changed here. So in Colorado, for example, the sign-up period is from November 1st to January 12th. Um, in California, uh, individuals shopping for individual market plans on the exchange will still have the same three months to, to look for coverage and sign up that, that we had previously. So November 1st to January 31st still for this year. Um, Washington State, it's November 1st to January 15th, so just double check if you're in the market for a new insurance and you're not sure when open enrollment is, just double check with your state's marketplace. If, you, if your state doesn't run its own marketplace, then most likely your open enrollment period is November 1st to December 15th. Okay, so if you are looking to purchase coverage through the exchange or through the marketplace, um, there are a couple, there's a, a few different options that should be available. So um, these are often referred to as the metal tiers of coverage. Uh, as you can see in the picture, although I guess it's not super, super clear, platinum coverage is where the plan covers 90% of your healthcare costs, you cover 10%, and then it goes down um, all the way to bronze where you know you are responsible for 40% of your healthcare costs, the plan is responsible for 60. As you can imagine, the monthly premiums for a bronze plan are usually substantially less than the monthly premiums for a platinum plan. So it's sort of up to you whether it makes sense financially uh, you know, can I afford to pay higher premiums now and potentially pay less when I actually have to go in for treatments or, you know, doctor visits, or, you know, is money really, really, really tight and you can't really afford to pay this stuff ongoing uh, on a monthly basis, but maybe once you have to go in for, you know, treatment or, or doctor visits, maybe you can afford to pay more at that time. So that's really up to you to take a look at. Um, if you are potentially eligible for some of these cost-sharing subsidies in addition to the premium tax credits, you generally have to purchase a silver plan. Um, so you might, if you're eligible for something called an enhanced silver plan, that means that based on your income, you might have more out-of-pocket savings with lower co-pays, lower co-insurance, and lower deductibles. So tax credits are currently available for people under age 65 who purchase coverage on their own through the health insurance marketplace and are not covered through their employer, through Medicare, or Medicaid. So premium subsidies are available to help people pay for health insurance and that will cap premiums on a sliding scale from 2 to 10% of your income. So essentially the way that this works, it's a little different from tax credits normally where, you know, at the end of the year or in, in April, April 14th, you might be trying to do your taxes and here's your income and here's your deductions and here are your credits and then it all comes out in the wash and maybe you get a check or maybe you don't. 
it's very different for um, for these types of tax credits. So instead of getting a check at the end of the year, the goal is to make your premiums more affordable on a monthly basis. So when you put in what your expected income is for the upcoming year, they take a look, they spit out some number based on their formula of how much of a tax credit you're entitled to based on your income, and then they prorate it throughout the year and your monthly premiums are reduced um, accordingly. There's also potentially um, a catastrophic plans available on the health insurance marketplaces, but you have to be under age 30. And even for someone under age 30, they're usually not a particularly good idea because they have really high deductibles and really aren't, aren't meant to provide true health insurance. Okay, so just really quickly, I did want to touch a little bit on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I mentioned Medicaid as another potential insurance option, and so Medicare is the program that, it's a federal program, and it's for people who are age 65 or older, or for people who have been receiving SSDI for at least 24 months. And as I mentioned earlier, I will, we will be doing a webinar specifically on Medicare next month. So this is about the extent that I'm gonna be talking about Medicare in today's workshop. Um, on the other hand, we have a program called Medicaid, and Medicaid traditionally was a program that uh, for people with very, very low income, very, very limited resources, so, you know, not much money in the bank, cash on hand, you know, they don't look at the house you live in and the car that you use, but essentially you, you generally have to have very little by way of, of resources. And then you often also had to meet some sort of categorical eligibility. You had to be over 65 or blind or disabled or pregnant or have dependent children. Um, so if your income in the past, if your income was under whatever their uh, their limit was in your state, and you know it varies from state to state a little bit because Medicaid is um, run by the states even though it's, it's funded quite substantially by the federal government. Um, so you not only had to meet one of these categorical eligibility uh, requirements and have really low income and assets, um, and then if you met all of those requirements, you might be able to get Medicaid for free or depending on what state you live in, some states offer a, a share of cost program where if your income is a little bit too high, you sort of spend down each month before Medicaid starts paying. But one major thing that has changed under the Affordable Care Act is that the Medicaid programs in many states have been expanded. So in the states that have opted into Medicaid expansion, you can now qualify for Medicaid just based on your income. They don't look at your assets and you don't have to meet any other of those categories of eligibility. Um, the income limit that they look at is 138% of the federal poverty line. It's technically 133%, but they have a 5% income disregard, so we just say 138%. Um, and as I mentioned, states can choose to opt in or not. So as of January 2017, this is what it looks like. This is the current status of state Medicaid expansion decisions. Um, I think it's about 30 states, oh, 32 states, including DC, that have adopted Medicaid expansion, um, and then 19 have chosen not to. Um, so a central goal of the ACA was to significantly reduce the number of uninsured people. Um, and so Medicaid expansion was one way that, that the government was hoping to really get a lot more low-income people covered by some sort of health insurance. Um, originally, the plan was for every single state to be required to uh, expand their Medicaid programs, but the Supreme Court's decision in 2012 um, basically said that we, the federal government could not require the states to accept the federal money, that they had to opt in, and for that reason, um, 
many states sort of in the middle and south of the country have chosen not to opt in. And unfortunately, we hear from people in a lot of those states, and specifically Texas and Florida, we get a lot of calls from people who are really struggling to, to find some sort of health coverage that they can afford. Um, so we, we have definitely seen that the states that have not expanded Medicaid, they're still facing some pretty serious issues with health coverage and health access. So putting some of the pieces together here, um, in states that have expanded Medicaid, um, you generally have to, you can be eligible for Medicaid if you earn less than 138% of the federal poverty line, if you earn between 138 and 400% of the federal poverty line, and I have a couple of numbers on the slide here that, that give you a sense of what that annual income looks like. But for those Medicaid expansion states, the option is either Medicaid under 138% of the federal poverty line, or you might be eligible for tax credits if you purchase through the marketplace if you're between 138 and 400. Because of the way the law was written, it's a little bit complex, a little, it's a little different in the states that have not expanded Medicaid. So if you live in a state that has not expanded Medicaid, uh, potentially you, in order to be eligible for Medicaid, you would still have to qualify based on your income and assets and categorical eligibility, or if you are earning between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty line, you might be eligible for tax credits if you purchase a plan through the exchange or marketplace. So I know that that's a little bit um, complicated there, and really just depends on, on which state you live in to know what numbers to look at for, for income to see what you're eligible for. And if you know someone who's potentially looking to purchase insurance and you don't really know, well, is their income around 138 or is it over 400%? Or, you can always go on to healthcare.gov or your state's marketplace and type in some info. You don't even have to set up an account but it will usually tell you what the different options are and if it looks like you would potentially be eligible for Medicaid in your state, um, then your, the marketplace will tell you that and you can enroll th uh, through, the, through the marketplace. And also as a really quick aside, Medicaid does not have any sort of special enrollment periods or open enrollment periods. You can sign up for Medicaid at any time if that's something that um, you might potentially be eligible for. Okay, so I know that I am just about out of time here, but I did want to quickly go over some information about health insurance appeals. Um, I mean, most people that I know have had some sort of issues with their insurance not covering something that they expected to be covered or hoped would be covered. Um, unfortunately, insurance companies do not actually seem to be in the business of providing health care. They're in the business of making money. So here are a few tips on how to handle insurance appeals if you're ever faced with this issue. So just keep in mind you can appeal denials of coverage or you know, insufficient coverage. Uh, private insurance companies have varying procedures for appeals. The process for completing the appeal should be found in the denial letter sent by the insurance company and should also contain information about strict timelines that must be followed for a successful appeal. If you haven't actually gotten a formal denial from your insurance company, you can't appeal yet. You might actually have to ask them to put it in writing that they are denying coverage. If you just call up somebody and say, hey, do you know if this is gonna be covered or not? And they just give you sort of an informal answer, like, no, I don't think so, or, oh, you should submit this separately. That's not a formal denial. You would get a, you should get it in writing. Um, and again, as I mentioned previously, the medical teams that we work with are often unaware of the insurance difficulties that patients can face. And so if you're having trouble getting something covered by your insurance company, whether it's a prescription drug, a certain treatment, a certain surgery, whatever, it can be a really good idea to bring that up with your medical team because a lot of times doctors are more than willing to try to help you uh, with an appeal by writing a letter or providing additional documentation about why that particular service or 
medication is necessary. So these rules that I'm about to talk about are only in the context of private insurance. Medicare and Medicaid might have different uh, ins uh, appeals processes, so just keep that in mind. So there are two different types of appeals, and I only have, I think, a couple more slides here, so please bear with me. Um, so for health insurance appeals, there's two different types. Generally, first you have to go through the internal appeals process. Um, the internal appeal is where you are appealing directly back to that same insurance company that has just made the decision not to cover whatever it is that you were trying to get covered. Um, and sometimes you might only have to do that once. Sometimes they will have two or three levels of appeal within the insurance company. Um, and Another thing to keep in mind is that billing is almost always on the slow track, and so if you have a billing dispute and you are thinking about, okay, is it time for, should I go through the internal appeal, do I, how do I handle this appeal, if, if something, if you've already received a bill from your provider or from the hospital, it's a really good idea to give them a call and let them know, hey, look, I got this bill. I don't think that I should be responsible for it. I'm fighting with my insurance company to, to get them to cover it. And if you let them know that, a lot of times that can help prevent the bill from going into collections. So if you are thinking about insurance appeals, that's just one other thing to keep in mind, that the bill doesn't just go away while you're going through the appeals process. You might have to give the hospital or doctor's office a heads up that you are trying to appeal and they might sort of put it on the back burner for another three or six months while you're going through the appeal. Um, so generally once you've gone through the internal appeals process, then you can go to an external appeal, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, unless the issue is urgent. So there are different timelines based on whether the request is just sort of routine or if it's an urgent request, if your doctor is saying you need to have surgery within the next week to repair this, that, or the other thing, and your insurance company says, no, we're not going to cover it, that might be something that's potentially urgent because it might be a life or death situation. Even though getting medical bills can feel really urgent, if you've already had the service or treatment and you're trying to dispute whether or not the insurance company should cover it or how much they should cover, that's usually not something that is considered urgent. Um, insurance companies generally have to make a decision within 60 days for medical services that are already, that you've already received, and then 72 hours in urgent cases. So an external review um, sometimes called an independent medical review. Essentially, it's where you go and you seek um, input, essentially, from some from individuals that are not connected to the insurance company. Usually the external review process or IMR process is handled through the State Department of Insurance. In California, we have two different state agencies that handle insurance depending on whether you have an HMO or whether you have a PPO and what type. So that can be a little complicated, but both the Department of Managed Healthcare and the Department of Insurance in California have an IMR process. If you're not sure, you know, if you live in a state where you, you know, if you don't live in California essentially and you're not really sure how to go about an external review, you can always contact the CLRC. We actually have a step-by-step -step guide to insurance appeals on our website as well, um, which has some sample letters and also outlines the process for going through um, both internal and external appeals. Um, when the IMR organization has completed its review of your particular case, they'll have determined whether your disputed healthcare service is medically necessary. Usually you cannot go through an external appeal if your issue is that something is simply not covered under your insurance plan. So maybe you're trying to get your chiropractor visits covered, if your health insurance plan explicitly says, you know, we don't cover 
or maybe you're going for acupuncture. I think that's something that's pretty rarely covered by insurance. So if you're trying to say, no, my acupuncture is medically necessary, but your insurance policy explicitly says we do not cover acupuncture, that's not going to be something that you can do an external review on. But if it's, you know, my doctor says that I need this particular type of surgery using this particular type of laser, um, you know, then, and their insurance company saying no, that might be the type of thing that you could, you know, move forward with an external review on. So usually, as I mentioned, you have to exhaust the internal appeals process before you can move forward with an external appeal unless the situation is urgent. Um, in California, you have six months to request an external review, but that does vary uh, depending on what state you live in. But for the most part, when people get to the external review or the independent medical review, um, more than 50% of the time, the health plan's denial of service is overturned, at least in California. So it can be a good idea to try to go through the external review um, and not take no for an answer. So thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, as we discussed, we went over some of the health insurance basics, gave some tips for taking control of your health care, went through some of the current insurance rules and options, covered a little bit about insurance appeals. I did want to share a couple of resources with you um, if you are curious about, um, you know, have more questions about um, insurance and insurance navigation. You can always reach out to any of these organizations and then obviously you're more than welcome to contact the CLRC and we can give you a little bit more information about what the rules might be in your state. Um, and then as things continue to progress over the next week or so, um, we'll try to keep you informed um, with you know information about what's currently going on with respect to the ACA. So I'm, I know I went over time a little bit. I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'm happy to try to answer a couple of questions if anyone has any.